Bridging finance, it can be so expensive, so why would you want to use it? In fact, is it a great way to be able to build a property portfolio really fast? In this video, I want to break down what bridging finance is, how it works, and a few key things you really must understand before you decide if it's the right thing for you. If you're watching my videos for the first time, my name is Saj Hussain. On this channel, I share with you my 15 years of property investing experience to ultimately help you get further faster in your property investing journey. When it comes to bridging finance and bridging loans, the first thing to say is, I'm not a financial advisor, but I have a huge amount of experience when it comes to property investing, and that's ultimately what I'm sharing with you. Think about a bridge or a bridging loan, a bridging finance, in the traditional sense of a bridge. What does a bridge do? A bridge allows you to get over an obstacle. So you get on one from one side, you go over the obstacle and off at the other end. And bridging on property is very similar. And essentially what you're doing is taking a short-term loan to bridge a gap. So you're purchasing the property or maybe even borrowing against an existing property. And often it's very quick. It can also help you to be able to purchase property that may be unmortgageable as well. If you're gonna purchase a property, why not just purchase it on a traditional mortgage? Isn't that the normal way to do it? Well, the main difference between a bridging loan and a mortgage is the time frame. i.e. a bridging loan is much more shorter. It tends to be maybe anything up to a year and sometimes even as short as maybe even a month. Whereas a mortgage will be maybe 10 years going up to say 30 years. So the time frame that you have that particular loan for is different. And that means that bridging loans work better for certain types of situations. For example, if you're using the buy, refurbish, refinance strategy, or if you're buying to add value and sell on, either of those two strategies, you're only needing the finance for a short period of time. And this is where a bridging loan can work really well. If you're interested in any of those strategies, I'll link up in the description below videos I've done on those specific topics so you can watch those straight after this video. So let's look at the individual circumstances where bridging loans work really well. If you've ever tried to purchase a property through auction, you'll know speed is of the essence. Or if you're purchasing a property through an estate agent, they tell you it's unmortgageable, that means cash purchases only. It doesn't actually have to be cash, it just means a traditional mortgage is not going to work. And then these are the reasons where bridging tends to work really well because bridges will understand these types of transactions and they're set up and geared up to lend on these particular types of purchases. And what it also means that they're asset-based lenders and what that really means is that they're lending against the property, the asset, they're lending you money against that, as opposed to you as an individual and your income. They're not really looking at how much you earn. They're looking at what is the value of the property and lending you money against that. I hear property investors often talk about bridging can be so expensive. And yes, I agree, it is expensive, and this is why it only works in certain circumstances. And the type of circumstance it works really well in is either you purchase the property below, significantly below what it's worth, its true value, so you're getting quite a substantial discount in terms of equity on day one, or you're gonna add a lot of value to that property, i.e. increase the value, increase the amount of equity you've got in that property. So hence justify the cost that you're gonna incur to go the property through a bridge. And remember, with a bridge, what it is, it's asset-based lending, so it's about what's that property worth, how much can you borrow against it? To get the ball rolling, the first thing we need to do is identify the property that we want to borrow against, i.e. have the bridge against. That may be a new purchase or it may even be an existing property you already have. And then it's about finding a good, competent mortgage broker, a broker that's gonna be able to help you with regards to bridging. So what's the difference between a regular broker and a great broker? Well, it really comes down to experience. So really you're looking for a broker that does lots of bridging regularly, as opposed to one that says, hey, yeah, I know one of those bridge things, I can complete an application for you and send it off. So that's really the difference difference, you're looking for someone that's very experienced so they can give you the personalized advice that you need about the bridge and what it is ultimately you're trying to achieve. What they will then do is uh, prepare an application for you. The initial application they send off to a suitable lender, they'll find who they think is going to be right for what you're trying to achieve and they'll come back with what's called a decision in principle, which means in principle the lender is okay with this type of deal, this type of structure and lending money to you. The next stage then is the full application where they send the full application off and you'll need to provide all the relevant details for what it is you're doing there. And they'll arrange then at this point to be getting a surveyor, a valuer to, uh, to the property to have a look at the property 
property because remember it is asset based lending so that it's really important that they are happy with the asset that they're going to lend against when that report comes back it'll go back to the uh, lender the lender's underwriting team will then look at it and make a final assessment make sure they're happy they might even come back to you at this stage for more information from you once they've got that and they're happy and it's good to go to the next stage which is the legals which is then the solicitors they're taking over and wrapping it all up making sure they're they're dotting all the i's and, and crossing all the t's to make sure that everything is in order and then we can complete and wrap up the deal whether that's releasing the money or sending the money across to be able to get the purchase done before we get into the costs and look at the breakdown of what's involved in bridging and all the numbers you need to understand make sure you watch this video all the way to the end because i'm going to share with you the five biggest pitfalls that it's really important that you avoid when it comes to costs of bridging, it's not just simply a case of what's the interest rate, there's a number of other costs you need to be aware of as well. There's the headline rate, as it's known as, which is the interest rate that'll be advertised or what you'll be paying for that loan. And often these tend to be close to about 1% a month. So over a year, that's like 12% typically. Then also you'll have a setup fee as well, a setup cost uh, or an entry fee, and that might be 1%, sometimes it might be higher, it may even be 2%. And some uh, lenders will also charge you an exit fee, which might be 1% as well. So it might be 1% to set up, 1% to exit, or it may be that it's just 2% to set up, but there's those fees to think about as well. Then apart from those, you've got administration fees, you'll have a valuation fee you'll have to pay. The broker will also charge you a fee as well, and that could be anything from a few hundred pounds to a percentage of the overall money that they're getting for you. When you take all that into consideration, that can add up to quite a bit of money that you need to think about. Let's put some context around that. So if we're borrowing, say, £100,000 from a bridging lender, there's a £100,000 loan that we're going to have. So we're going to be paying 1% a month, let's say over a year, just to keep the numbers really simple. That's 12% over a year that you'll be paying. You'll be paying maybe a 1% setup fee and a 1% exit fee as well. So that's another 2% there that's added on. So your 12,000 now is 14,000 pounds. Then you've got the, you have to pay for the valuation, the survey essentially, and also we probably have an admin fee. Let's say it's about another thousand pounds. Now we're up to 15,000 pounds or 15% so far that we paying plus you'll have uh, the solicitor's fee so maybe another couple of thousand pounds let's now put some context around the numbers that we're talking about so if you're going to a lender a bridging lender and borrowing a hundred thousand pounds from them what are the costs that you need to think about well first of all you've got the interest rate that you'll be paying each month or sometimes called the headline rate and this can be quite deceptive because it's, that's not the only cost you'll be incurring and this may be around one percent a month i say around because it can be a lot lower than this but generally it's not much more if it is if that sort of range so let's say on a hundred thousand pounds you're paying 1% a month, so that's £12,000 a year you'll be paying. Just keeping the numbers really simple, looking at it as an annualised uh, calculation. Then you'll have a setup fee that you'll have paid, maybe 1%. You also have an exit fee that you might have to pay another 1%. Some lenders won't charge you an exit fee, they'll just charge you a higher entry fee, but the cost tends to be about the same. So they might charge you 2% entry as opposed to 1% entry and 1% exit. So you've got that £2,000 there. Then you've got, so so far we're at £14,000. Then you've got valuation fee and maybe some admin costs as well. Let's say that's about £1,000 there. You've got your legal fees that you'll have to pay from your side. You've got the legal fees for the lender you'll have to pay as well. So let's say a couple of thousand pounds there. And you'll have your broker's fees that you'll need to pay that you know, could be a thousand, uh, that could be one percent, sorry, of the amount that you're borrowing. So, in this example, say a thousand pounds. When you add all that up, that's about sixteen thousand pounds of costs that have been added on for the privilege of borrowing this hundred thousand pounds. Now, that's quite a lot sixteen percent when you look at it in that way. Now, I'm not saying it's going to cost you sixteen percent every time you go and borrow money from a bridger, but the point here I'm trying to make is it's really important that you are aware of all of these costs and how they might impact your deal. A lot of what we've been talking about right now is getting a bridge, getting on a bridge and purchasing a property in this way. But the really key thing that very few people tend to talk about is getting off the bridge. That is just as important as taking a bridge is how you're going to exit off it. Because remember, when we started this video, we talked about a bridge, bridging a gap, a short gap is allowing you to get over an obstacle. And that's what we're doing here. So it's important that you have a good plan. And there's only two ways to come off a bridge. You either sell the property or you remortgaging it to clear the bridge uh, that's already there at the moment. So it's important to be thinking about what your exit is and a plan B for your exit as well. Before we talk about the interest payments, how they work and how you need to pay them, if you're enjoying this content and make sure you smash that like button, subscribe to the channel and enable the notification bell so YouTube are notifying you when we're releasing videos just like this one. So that way you're not missing out on any of this great content. 
When it comes to interest payments, there's three ways that this can be done in terms of how you're making these payments. The most common way is that interest is retained or it's deducted up front. What that means is if we go back to the example we made earlier on of a hundred thousand pounds loan from the bank and you've got twelve thousand pounds of interest you're paying, let's say you assumed it was going to be over a year, what the bank will do or the lender will do, they're going to lend you £88,000 because they've already deducted the £12,000 interest that's due. So effectively they retain it, they deduct it before you even get the money. And many people tend not to understand this or be aware of this, so it's a big mistake. So on the day of completion when the money arrives, they're thinking, I'm short, where's the rest of the money? It's because the lender's already deducted the interest. The other way is a little bit more common with uh, traditional mortgages where you're servicing the debt each month. Or you're paying a monthly payment just like you would be paying a, uh, say a mortgage payment each month. And this is based on your affordability. So if you go down this route, what the lender will then do is look at your ability to be able to pay that each month. So once you've paid all your, your general expenses, you've got enough money left over to be able to service this monthly bridging loan. So if you are paying as monthly payments, they will look at your income and your affordability to see if that's going to be suitable. Then the third way is it's rolled up and paid at the end. So what that means is the interest is not actually paid uh, during the time, it's not even taken up front before you start, it's paid right at the end when you exit out of the deal. Now that tends to sound like the most appealing route but it only works in certain circumstances because the deal needs to stack and we'll talk about stacking the deal in just a few moments. With these lenders so keen to lend, you might be thinking, are they going to give me all the money I need to be able to purchase a property? So are they going to give me 100% of what I need? Well, it's actually not quite that simple. Generally speaking, when you're borrowing money in this way for bridging, you'll get about 70 or 75% of the purchase price. That's if the property is £100,000 you're purchasing uh, and they'll lend you about 70 or maybe £75,000 of that, just like they would, for example, on a mortgage. However, if the property is worth, say, £200,000 and you're purchasing for £100,000, there are a few lenders, but very few, that would lend you the full amount of money that you need, i.e. the full £100,000 to be able to do the purchase price. But generally speaking, these bridging loans are based on your purchase price as opposed to value. They're not lending on value, they're lending on what it is that you're actually paying for the property. However, there are ways you can use bridging to be able to get 100% borrowing. It just needs to be structured in the right way. Again, this is where a great mortgage broker can be able to help you and put this together for you. So let's say, for example, you're purchasing a property and uh, you are only going to get 75% from the bridging lender for that purchase. You're still 25% short and maybe you need some additional money to renovate it as well. So if you have another property and sometimes people might use their home. So if you've got a home, say it's worth £400,000, uh, let's say your existing mortgage on that is only £100,000, so you've got £300,000 of equity in that property. So it's about being able to maybe tap into some of that equity to be able to do this transaction. So on a traditional loan at 75%, you'd be able to borrow 75% um, uh, of the 400, i.e. £300,000. But if you've already got an existing loan on there, what you will find is with a bridging lender, what they're now having to do is take what's called a second charge. They're taking a second position on that property in terms of a lender because you've already got a mortgage of £100,000 and now a bridging lender is going to lend you some more money against that existing property and that will be by a second charge. However, what that also means is that they reduce the loan to value down typically to about 65%. So although the property is worth £400,000, they'll only lend a total value of £260,000, which is 65%. But you've already got a £100,000 loan, so that means the bridger would give you about £160,000. But hey, that might be enough for you to be able to cover the deposit on the other property because you've already got a 75% bridge in place for that one and it may give you enough funds to be able to renovate the property as well if you needed that. Now that's just an example and that might have just gone straight over your head in terms of how that was put together. But the point I'm making is it is possible sometimes to get 100% borrowing in this way, but a great broker will be able to help you and set it up and make it work. An important thing to mention at this stage is that bridging can both be regulated and unregulated. Regulated by who, you may be asking? Regulated by the FCA, so for example, like traditional mortgages and banks are. But there also can be unregulated, which is traditional business loans, and not treated in the same way. So the criteria and the hoops you have to jump through may vary depending on the type of transaction you're doing. So for example, if you're borrowing money against your home, often that will fall under regulated. Again, a great broker is going to be able to guide you through this and make sure you're doing it correctly. So let's now talk about the five pitfalls that you absolutely must avoid when it comes to bridging finance. 
The first one is having a clear exit in terms of refinance. So people often talk about when they're doing BRR, where they're buying, refurbishing and refinancing, what they're going to do is exit the bridge by remortgaging the property at the end. That's all well and good. Before you start and jump onto your bridge, it's really important that you've looked at how you're going to remortgage at the other end. So for example, the things where I see as common mistakes is people don't look at what their ability is to be able to remortgage, for example, their age, their income, the type of property. Uh, for instance, you might be using a bridge because the property is unmortgageable right now, it may be non-standard construction, and you purchased it on a bridge, hey presto, well done, you've got the property. But how are you going to get off the bridge? Because remember, it's short-term lending. So when you need to exit off that, you need to be sure there's going to be a lender at the other end that's going to enable you to put a long-term mortgage on it. When you are purchasing problematic properties, I say it's really important that it's those problems that you can fix as opposed to those ones you can't because then rather than resolving problems, you're inheriting problems. Pitfall number two is not having a plan B. Often people talk about the other exit is, well, hey, look, if I can't mortgage, I'll just sell the property. That's all well and good. But what if the market changes? What if the market starts to fall within slightly uncertain times right now? Let's say the price drops. Let's say the market drops by 10%. Where would that leave you in terms of profit? What if you are unable to sell because you haven't got enough equity now left in the property because you had some profit in there by the time you paid the bridging and it's dragged on for a little bit of time. You've tried to sell it, it hasn't sold. And what do you do now? You may be looking to remortgage it, but it's worth less. So you have to have a plan B in place to get off the bridge, are you going to be able to access some other funds if you need to, to make sure you can exit off the bridge safely? Because getting on the bridge is easy, but you want to get it off it as fast as you possibly can. Pitfall number three is bridging is easy, generally speaking, but don't assume you can get a bridge on everything and anything that you're looking at. There are also some properties that you'll be struggling to get a bridge on. So for example, often lenders will have a minimum amount that they want to lend. So if you're purchasing property, say at 50,000 pounds in some part of the country, hey presto, they're very cheap properties. But when it comes to bridging, the lender may not be open to lending such what they consider small amounts because the amount of paperwork and hassle and everything they've got to go through and the cost we talked about, is just not worth it for them and probably for you as well. And often, if you are able to get a smaller bridge, i.e. in terms of amount of money, it's not a huge amount that you're borrowing on a bridge, you've still got all the extra costs that you need to think about as well and the lender may charge you a higher interest rate because they're not really making much money. Effectively, they're in the business of making money from lending money. So they want to make as much money as they possibly can. Pitfall number four is being careful about who it is that you're actually borrowing this money from. Unfortunately, in this business, there are some unscrupulous lenders out there. Because it's partially unregulated the market, that means that they have very few rules that they have to abide by. And there's some unethical practices happening. I remember speaking to a friend of mine who's a senior position at a bridging lender that he used to work at. And he would meet other bridges as well and they'd say he was common practice for some unscrupulous bridges to lend money in situations where they knew that actually that borrower was not going to be able to repay that but the reason they would do that is because they knew they're going to be able to repossess that property at the end and get the property and so unfortunately there is some of these unethical practices that happen so you want to be really careful who you're working with and so you're going for an established player in the marketplace. Pitfall number five is misleading headline rates. So what I mean by that is sometimes you'll see a bridging loan being available at say 0.4% per month. You think, fantastic, that sounds really cheap. However, the criteria might be so difficult in terms of so strict or the loan to value might be so, so low that it means it actually is not possible to get that. So uh, unfortunately, sometimes you can end up with a Robert Warren where while you go make an application for one of these, then you find you're not quite eligible for that criteria. You're so far down the road speed is important and what you do you compromise and think okay what alternative products have you got that I could use and you end up with a higher rate so it's a little bit misleading to start with so it's important that you understand the criteria so look I hope this is making sense I hope you've enjoyed this content if you have please let me know in the comment section below one thing that you've learned from this video I'd really appreciate that so that when we're doing these videos I know that you'll find them useful thank you so much for watching and I look forward to seeing you again on the next video